Good morning, everyone. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet today. On behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'm Professor Neville Plint, the Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute here at the University of Queensland, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. The SMI Production Centres, Technical Innovation and Mining Industry of 2050 by Professor Rick Valenta. Professor Rick Valenta will be discussing how the production centres focus on technical innovation can help address the mineral industry's societal, environmental, energy and supply challenges. Rick currently leads the SMI production centres and that's the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Centre and the Julius Krishnitz Mineral Research Centre, as well as leading our complex all body strategic program. And Rick does all of that before tea time. Um, so, so thank Rick. Um, his research interests lie predominantly improving the discovery, mining and processing of ore deposits with a focus on better understanding the underlying processes which lead to the localization and characteristics of these deposits. He has over 20 years industry experience. Um, and as always, um, those that are online, if you could please use the Q&A button at the bottom um, of your screen and put your questions in. And then when we get to the end, um, Rick will answer those questions. So Rick, um, over to you. And thank you very much for today's seminar. Oh, thanks very much, Neville, and thanks everyone for um, for dialing in um, or connecting in. I guess not dialing in. Um, so, um, as Neville said today, I'm going to be talking about the production centers in JK Tech. And you might be saying to yourself, "Well, um, you know, often these talks are are a little bit sciencey. There will be some sciencey things in here, um, but I guess the reason that I wanted to talk about the production centers in JK Tech, um, or you know, I'll refer to them collectively as the production centers." I guess group, if you want to call it that, going forward, um, is that in the last couple of years, we've, I guess, gone through um, a, a process of integration that has resulted in a group that works much more closely together on shared problems, that collaborates a lot more and takes full advantage of the of the capabilities of the of the group. Um, here to get this going. This is the group I'm talking about. So. There's um, 112 faces, heads, brains on on this uh, on this photograph, and it's basically um, um, with with my apologies for anybody I left out. It's it's all the the staff, um, students, and administrative people who um, who collectively get this this group of people um into a state where <laughs> where they can make the the sort of advances and accomplishments that we um you know that we've set for ourselves in this in this area and everything i talk about today um will have arisen from the uh from the minds of the of the people you see on the screen now and um and you know with that in mind basically um if you forget all the other slides uh to the content of this slide that leads to, to everything else and is by far our most important asset. And of course, we're part of the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Um, and I think looking at the list of people online, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this because I think it's mostly people who are very aware of what the, the SMI is. Similarly, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about our structure because I think almost everybody um, in the attendees list understands it very well. Um, the, the, um, the group I'm going to focus on of centers is the WH Bryan Mine Geology Research Center, the Julius Krishnit Mineral Research Center, and the uh, and, and JK Tech. There, that's the group that's sort of collectively referred to as the production centers. And the reason that we're called that is that we focus on the part of the mining value chain. Well, we focus on almost all of the mining value chain, but really the productivity and technology part of the mining value chain, the, the, the um, you know, trying to solve, trying to use those tools to solve the, the problems that we need in order to, to address some of the, the, the challenges that are, you know, that we're, that we're dealing with right now. Um, and 
the first departure from what I would normally do in a talk like this is that I don't think I've ever given a talk before where I've quoted a speech from a politician. Um, but uh, but there is a very relevant, I think, context setting um, speech from from our education minister, Alan Tudge, who's been in the job, I think, since around the beginning of, of 2021, um, talking about commercialization of university research, which he's really set as the as the defining goal of of his um, occupation of the of the education ministry. Um, so here are some of the things he said. Um, he's very keen on universities working more with businesses and governments to translate what they do into products and businesses and ideas and and actual impact that has a that has a um, bearing on on society. Um, and to the extent possible, they want academics, he would like to see academics become entrepreneurs or, or I, I guess I would say put together the teams that would allow them to make entrepreneurial accomplishments and take their ideas from the lab to the market. Um, and part of the reason that he set this as a goal is that um, looking at the last 20 years as, uh, as a group of researchers in Australian universities, we've presided over a 400% increase in research output, so papers. We um, are driven by them. Um, we have created a whole ecosystem where the people produce, that produce papers judge other people that produce papers and decide who gets money on the basis of the innovation and, uh, and, and accomplishment, I guess, represented in those papers. And over that same 20 years, there's been little or no increase in commercial output of potential benefit to industry or society um, in terms of inventions, startups, um, other things that you might use to, uh, um, I, I think saying benefit to society wasn't a correct thing to say, but of, I guess, of, of benefit to some of the real world challenges that, uh, that we're facing. I think he was at pains to point out that it's, it's important that not everybody goes down that route, but it's also important that our increase in tangible industry impact keeps pace with our in, increase in, in Beltway research output. So as an example of that, um, one of the bits of information that he pointed out in his speech was that for every billion dollars in research expenditure, Australia produced three startups while Canada, the US and UK produce more than twice as many. I've, I've highlighted that because I wanna come back to that a little bit later in the talk in the context of what we do. And of course, we've heard lots of talks from various people about uh, one of the big challenges here is that research ideas have, uh, there's a great gulf between coming up with an idea and saying uh, this, somebody ought to turn this into something that can work and actually making that happen. And that in my particular area of geoscientific research, that happens all the time. Um, huge expenditure in geoscientific research produces fantastic results where the conclusion is by this method, somebody in the future may be able to turn it into something that's of use to someone, not me. Um, and so there, you know, there's a real need to, to improve the way we translate our outcomes. Into, into actual um, benefits to, to industry, society, the economy, and so on. And, and he, need, he also said we need to create a cultural collaboration between universities and industry as a bedrock for innovation commercialization. I'm going to come to, back to that one as well. And another one um, that, that, uh, that came out in this speech was uh, the question, how can we get more students to have industry experience and count that experience as credit towards their qualification. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to that. Um, and and you're probably some of you are probably already guessing why I'm going to come back to all those things, because our response to all of these ideas could be what took you so long, um, because the JKMRC and more recently JK Tech and the BRC have been putting into practice a lot of these principles for a half a century. So there's been a, 
there's been a, a consultation paper that's been put out. It's actually closed. The, the responses were, were put out in or were received in April. A lot of groups commented um, and, you know, universities, industry bodies, and so on. Um, the design elements they talked about, and I'm only really going to focus on two of them um, for this university research commercialization framework was number one around industry university collaboration. How can we make it be better, basically? And I'm going to talk for, about that for a second. And then mission driven research. What are the missions that we should be supporting in order to um, have the greatest impact on broader society as a whole? Um, so I'm going to, and I'm going to ignore the other things because they're sort of more around how you would run whatever new scheme happened along those lines. But but industry university collaboration and coming up with a mission that is relevant to industry and society is really at the core of our existence. So now I want to talk a little bit about industry university collaboration. So again, looking at the audience, I don't think I have to spend too much time talking about uh, the SMI production centers and JK Tech. Um, so we're, uh, at, I will spend a tiny amount of time talking about them. So about 45 research and consulting staff when you add them all up, around 46 um, higher degree by research students. And one thing to point out in context of the, uh, of the speech I just summarized was over 90% of those are directly in collaboration with industry. So, in, in fact, I, I only said over 90% because I was trying to think of any that weren't. Um, and if I said 100%, people wouldn't believe me, but it's essentially 100%. Um, we don't do projects that don't have an industry collaborative component. We have a large number of projects where the, the, actual, the actual HDR candidate is employed by a company, where, where the company is providing substantial financial support, um, and, and other ones where, where companies are providing substantial in-kind support. We have a large amount of, of industry partners. For our industry, we have a, a, a pretty um, enviable gender balance and a large number of research collaborations. And I'm not going to talk about all these, these big themes because uh, um, I, I'm going to come back to those in, in the context of some examples later on. So that's a little snapshot and, and a, a very brief history. The three groups I'm talking about, JKMRC on the left here, founded in 1970, focused on mineral processing from um, a relatively small amount by today's standards, but generous at the time, seed funding from, from Mount Isa Mines. And of course, most of you will recognize Albin Lynch on the right, the founding director of, of the Julius Kirshner Mineral Research Center, um, and, uh, and, and T.C. Rao on the left, one of its earliest students, and, and one of the students whose, I guess, candidature established the model that's still used today in the production centers, which is to embed students in um, industry, in the business and, and objectives of industry partners. Um, and and to work closely with industry in order to align the research that gets carried out to outcomes in industry. So, um, and then JK Tech, which was founded in 1985 as really probably one of the first spin outs from JKMRC, um, focused on commercialization of JKMRC research. It was spun out in 1985 with a $100,000 loan that was paid back in, uh, in 18 months. And finally, the BRC, founded in 1991, so 30th, 30th anniversary this year, focused on mining geology, but has also had substantial input in, um, in the mining area and is now the, the WH Bryan um, Mining and Geology Research Center um, with substantial support from the Bryan Foundation um, at the start and, and to this day. Um, we're working closely with... with um, with Bob Bryan and the Bryan Foundation on, on a new initiative, even as we speak. And I want to talk a little bit about the track record of that combined group, um, just because of the fact that it's a, it's a good, um, I think, reminder of, you know, when I, when I say that we've accomplished a lot of the things or, or worked very closely in some of the areas that are current education minister has said are of increasing importance to the university secretary or university sector. 
um, is to say that that um, our, as a group, we have a, a large and experienced staff that carry out consulting and research with over 500 years of combined industry or consulting experience. So the typical profile of a, of a person in the production centers is someone who has had some industry experience as well as academic experience. And when you look at years of experience, we have uh, a mixture of people who have a relatively small but significant amount, as well as people who have spent a long time in industry. Um, the, the, um, when you look in the middle here, the JK Tech, this is a figure for JK Tech and would be a lot larger if you did the accounting for all of the benefits or for all of the um, um, value created by a JKMRC and, and BRC work, but over 1.8 billion, and that's an estimate from about five years ago. Um, the combined research, external research income and consulting over the last 10 years, about $250 million. Um, we've been commercializing products relevant to the mining industry for more than 35 years. Um, an example of that is modeling and simulation, more than 20 um, software solutions and products, um, technology transfer and training, um, more than, you know, last year in the middle of COVID, we reached more than 15,000 mining professionals online um, through, through webinars and, and other means. And thinking about that spin out figure, of less than three per per billion dollars. Well, um, Tim Napier Munn a couple of years ago did an est did a, a, a summary or, or a, a review of of all of the achievements of the JKMRC and the JKMRC alone um, resulted in more than ten spin out companies. So so this is something that we've been involved in for for a long time. And you will a lot of you will have seen. Um, Neville showing this, this diagram, uh, our model really is to combine consulting, funded research, development of tools, software and products, and professional development, and have all of those activities feed off of each other. Um, if you look in more detail um, and, and think about how that works in terms of people, what you have is, I guess, what I think of as, as three different groups. We have people mainly working predominantly in JK Tech, who have 100% um, or nearly 100% consulting focus and probably nearly 100% industry experience. Um, and, and they're really focused on, on a close connection with industry, um, managing projects that deliver value for, for industry and, and maintaining a good industry network. And then we have a large group that would make up the bulk of the production centers who are what I'd call applied researchers, who almost all of whom would have relevant industry experience of anywhere from you know a couple of years to twenty three or so years in my case, um, who are carrying out a mixture of predominantly research, but also twenty to thirty percent consulting, working in collaboration with consulting principals, and then another important group that we have within the production centers are what I'd call fundamental researchers, people who may have no industry experience, but what they do have is a lot of fundamental understanding of mathematics or physics or, or other you know, fundamental disciplines that can have the potential to provide an underpinning to the work that we do in, in other areas. And that combined group of people can accomplish much more than a, than, than a group that is 100% focused on just consultants. Here's another way to look at that, that group. Um, so, you know, the combination of research and consulting may, may not be the most common thing that you see around the place, but it has a lot of important benefits. So here's a recent case study where, where um, JK Tech and in this case, JKMRC working together with a major client on flotation optimization, then spun out a series of research projects looking at particular aspects of, of the, the consulting that needed more work that may ultimately lead to development of new software tools that could have potential for a much broader application and commercialization within the industry. And we're developing a whole series of those research commercialization initiatives with support from our consulting arm. So, 
I'm not going to go through the details of all these initiatives. I will touch on some of them um, on some of them further on in the talk. But when we look, um, the there are there are a whole series of initiatives at various different technology readiness levels from four to seven, which is just moving into what what uh, a lot of people call the valley of death, where we've identified a commercialization path, identified a potential market, and and are are working on turning those those initiatives into um, products that can be um, commercialized in a way that will maximize benefit to industry. So that's um, industry university collaboration, uh, the way we do it. I want to talk now a little bit about mission driven research. And um, I guess I'm not going to talk about the the um, you know the mechanics of mission driven research. What I'm going to talk about is oh um, you know what's our mission? Uh, how do we how do we derive what our what our mission is in 2021? Because I think it's a little bit different to what it might have been um, you know 40 or 50 years ago when this whole initiative was getting going. So what are the current mining industry challenges? I've given a few talks on these, so this is going to be hopefully a very kind of brief pricey of some of those things. And this is a a summary from 2020 of projections of metal demand. And, and what you see is a whole bunch of graphs across a whole range of commodities moving to the upper right as we go out to 2050. So um, there's obviously a disagreement about, about specifics of numbers um, and much variation from commodity to commodity. But the general trend is that if we're going to accomplish the targets that we've set ourselves in terms of sustainable development in terms of decarbonization uh, and so on, we're going to see enormous growth in demand of most, most commodities. Um, and an, another uh, important and very visible phenomenon that's happening right now is the realization that climate change really is happening. And I know a lot of people say, well, we knew that, duh. we knew that for a long time, but, but I think it's, um, achieving more broad uh, penetration within the industry. Um, and, and this diagram, you know, I'm not going to go into too much specifics here other than to say that if we do nothing, which is the, um, I guess, the, um, the, the, the SSP 8.5 scenario, um, then, then the red areas are the areas that will be officially uninhabitable um, by our definitions in, uh, in, in 2050, which is not where we want to go. And of course, the industry response to that, which I've talked about before, is that um, for the most part, in fact, almost without exception, um, industry has now embraced the need to, um, to make um, reductions in scope one and two emissions, to reach net zero emissions by a range of different targets from 2030 to 2050, to tie executive compensation to accomplishment of emissions related goals, even look at scope three emissions, um, you know, that they they're not directly responsible for um, and 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 so on. So so this is a this is a reality of 2021 that is definitely something that we need to take into account and address. And of course, the other thing that that we've been doing for a few years now is trying to understand and respond to um, the 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 big challenge of achieving the mineral supply that I showed in the in the first slide in this section, um, because in the past a lot of uh, I guess a lot of analyses and a lot of discussions around mineral supply focused on the technological advances required in order to allow lower grade and more technically challenging deposits to be put into production, and um, the I'm not going to spend a huge amount more time talking about this, but but the um, uh, but a lot of the work that we've been doing and we and we published quite a lot on in the last little while is showing that now the main impediment to achieving the mineral supply that we're going to need in the future for a broad range of commodities is much more related to um, environmental and social challenges and regulatory challenges. Um, that are impeding mineral supply from being achieved. So um, the, the message for the production centers is that we need to focus on innovation that will allow us to, to, to 
improve the acceptability of those mining operations that we want to put into production rather than just technological advances that will lower cost or increase efficiency. Um, another thing that, that we're reaching the end of, I think, is economies of scale. So this is the volume of flotation cells over time from 1900 to, to now. Um, there's one from 1916, a tiny, those tiny little boxes. Here's one from Bougainville in 1973. Uh, the tanks are a little bit bigger. And here's one from a, a few years ago at Buena Vista del Cobre, um, that a much larger flotation cell. And the question is, can we just keep making everything bigger and bigger um, and accomplish the mineral supply that we need in the future? Um, but one, one um, implication of that, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this slide before, I've shown it a few times, is when we look at targets for future copper production and we look at the grades of the production likely to be able to achieve or, or likely to be required in order to obtain that supply, um, we can see that the, the grade is going up, going down, the demand is going up, and that means that the tailings that we produce are going exponential. So um, by 2050, we'll have produced you know, around nine times as much tailings as we did in the entire 20th century. And it's another argument to say we have to do something different than just continuing to um, attempt to grow mineral production through economies of scale. And so, um, you know, what you end up with out of that is a whole series of targets that you might set for, um, for improved, um, I, I guess, for an improved mining industry that can accomplish the goals that I was talking about. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about those, but this set of goals is um, really driving a lot of the work that, that, and work in which the production centers is, is quite strongly involved um, are the complex ore bodies program. So what I've done here is just place in the foreground um, a, a lot of the, the, um, the, the programs within the, uh, within the complex ore bodies program that are addressing some of those challenges. Now I'm going to, uh, this, is the, this is the slightly silly part of the section. The, the other way to look at this, so this is, that was a sort of a, a summary of, of kind of a broader assessment of, of where we are in terms of challenges. Um, what I'm gonna do now is, is a, a paraphrased summary of a conversation I had with one of our advisory board members who was talking about their current challenge as set to them by their management. Um, and I'm not saying that, that there's any relationship between the mining industry and the cat and hat, um, but, but uh, other than the fact that the drawing seemed apt. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is just say, all right, well, how, would, how, how, would, how did this person summarize their challenges? Well, first of all, they said, we have to improve our profitability and production rate without increasing our footprint. So um, we have to, we have to be more profitable, produce more metal um, for an equal or smaller footprint. Oh yeah, and we got to lower our emissions intensity by, I've said 20XX, some of them are, um, you know, they, they have different sort of comparative thresholds, different timing, most of them are 2030. Um, oh yeah, and, and then we've got to also reach net zero emissions by 20XX. So, so we have to uh, reduce our emissions to zero in the range of targets people have set between 2030 and 2050. And of course, we've got to accomplish all that whilst achieving a step change improvement in social and environmental performance. So, so that's, the, that's the task. That was the view of one of our advisory board members as to what, their, what the, um, the tasks they had on their plate in, um, in, in mid-2021. So I don't think writing papers is gonna help them. Um, so we're working on other things as well as um, writing up what we do when it's significant. So what are we doing? And now what I'm gonna do in the last little bit of time that I have is just talk about some of the selected initiatives that we're doing to address some of the challenges that I've just gone through. Um, and, and this is a part that's a little bit, I, I don't wanna say random, but I guess it's, it's, uh, it's not complete. It's just um, 
things that I thought would be of interest to people and things that I'm certainly excited about. It's not if you if um, if you work in the production centers and your particular thing didn't appear, it doesn't mean that it's not significant. It doesn't mean I'm not excited by it. Um, I, it just means that I only had 45 minutes. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, soft sensors for process control. So um, one of the things, one of the ways that we're going to get around this economy of scale thing is by improving the flexibility uh, and the flexibility of processing plants to deal with variability in the ores and to understand um, what exactly what the state of readiness and performance was of the various components of that processing plant. Um, and and you might say to yourself, well, why, why soft sensors? You know, people are developing sensors and tacking them onto the side of machines um, and, and doing measurements of, of various different types. But, but actually what it turns out is that um, you don't need a, a hard sensor if you can teach your program to speak SAGMIL. And that's what our group has done, basically. SAGMIL is saying that, that or the various mills and cyclones and everything are, are providing a constant stream of information about their state of health, if you can understand what they're saying. And, um, and that's what um, Mohsen Yahya's APCO group is doing. They're developing a whole series of, of basically pieces of software that read communication from the mill, from the cyclone, from pebble crusher, ball mill, and so on, that will allow them to understand what, uh, what the state is of those mills and what needs to be done next, what needs to be done to optimize their performance. And, and in terms of, I guess, commercialization of that research, um, in the case of the mill fit tool, we have eight installation and five more, eight in installations already, five more under negotiation, um, three of the cyclone that are current, uh, of the Cyclops system that are currently under negotiation and other of the tools in development. So uh, I guess a clear example of a, of a need that is being addressed by um, research outcome that's now being um, successfully commercialized. Here's another one. It's a little bit earlier in its, in its readiness stage, but, but is uh, you know, potentially very important. So um, high voltage pulse pre-concentration um, being led by uh, Frank Sheen, Christian Chris Antonio in, in, um, in Kim Rungi's separation group. Um, basically the principle behind high voltage pulse is that I've got two, two little rocks up here. This one's full of sulfides. This one's got no sulfides in it. Um, and, and basically we, we subject those to, uh, to a high voltage pulse um, and the sulfide bearing material is more conductive and, um, and, and so the, the, um, the application of that current results in breakage along the, uh, uh, along the, uh, the, the areas where sulfides occur and in the less, in, in the um, lower grade material, no breakage occurs or no weakening occurs um, through application of, of, of that high voltage pulse. So what we end up with is a situation where the, the mineralized rock easily breaks and can be screened and the unmineralized rock um, can't, it doesn't go through the screen because it doesn't break um, and, and can therefore be thrown away before we spend all this money and energy and, and greenhouse gas emissions grinding it up for no reason. And the, the advance that we've made is to actually come up with that concept, which has been known, known about for ages and ages and actually turn it into uh, a conceptual machine that could, in the future, be upscaled to the to to an operation. So here we're seeing variably mineralized rock that's going through and being being um, and being screened on the basis of the grade of the material. Um, and and this procedure in this in the case of this set of samples had a significant upgrade. Um, with a with a relatively small percentage of the of the overall ore. Another thing that that I think is very relevant to now, um, another way to deal with the the economies of scale problem is to develop smaller and more flexible processing approaches. Um, something that can be loaded up into a container, a container or doubled or tripled and and applied um, 
to to develop more flexible response, uh, uh, more flexible processing in response to a better understanding of variability. And um, and Mohsen Yahya and his team at APCO are developing a, a, a flexi lab that will allow um, that sort of processing applied to a whole range of different commodities, including the traditional commodities like copper, gold, uh, other base metals that we focus on, but also rare earths, vanadium, and 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 others. So um, that's uh, that's also I think an important uh, development. Um, another um, initiative that is um, that that's now well underway in the production centers is the coarse particle coarse particle flotation collaborative that involves a large number of sponsoring companies, a lot of the the world's major companies, and um, I'm not going to go through it's this is through Kim's separation group uh, Kim and uh, and Lisa Forbes are the um, are, are the uh, co project directors of this initiative. Um, the prize here is the ability to uh, accomplish higher throughput for the same amount of ore uh, or to to achieve actually higher throughput um, with a with a machine of the same size. Um, achieving more metal production while using less water and producing coarser tails that require less filtration and can be stored in a safer way. So, so this is a really important collaborative that's received um, significant industry support and is really a co-development with industry. Um, the, the, um, the, the other important um, area that, that I guess was emphasized by um, some of the projections I showed around the, the volume of copper tailings we expect in the future is the need to minimize tailings, to eliminate, reuse, um, make benign the future tailings that we're going to produce in the course of achieving the additional metal production that we need to get in order to accomplish um, decarbonization and achieve the sustainable development goals going forward. Um, and so we've developed a current initiative with, with Amira um, called the Retail Project that is looking at a range of different approaches to, to uh, uh, I guess, minimizing the impact of tailings and maximizing the commercial value of tailings um, and, and doing that in a way that will allow us to characterize uh, process and, and, I guess, neutralize tailings in the, in the best way possible. And this is an initiative in which the production centers are involved. It's being led by Anita Parbaker Fox, but has participation from across the, um, across the SMI. Um, with decarbonization being such an important factor of, of, um, of mining companies plans now, um, another area that, that, um, that we've done a lot of work in and are in, in the process of doing it, we're attempting to, to address some of the challenges that companies face is to develop a tool that will look at the complex interplay of factors associated with, with, um, with decarbonizing or reducing emissions from existing and new minerals plants. So what, what we're looking at here as I talk is a tool that Media Zadi has developed in order to um, in order to look at the potential impact of different mitigation um, options in a in a mining operation to uh, to reduce emissions and achieve the sort of targets that almost all the companies out there have set themselves. One of the the other areas that we're working in is is in critical metals uh, or new economy minerals, as the Queensland government calls it. Um, we we need to achieve more supply, so we've been involved in and just released. Um, about 50 gigabytes worth of data and, and four reports um, relating to the, the new economy mineral prospectivity of, of Queensland. Here's an example of that. Um, uh, statewide maps of overall prospectivity based on a range of different geological process models. Um, we've also continued our program of development of, of, of empirical knowledge around known new economy mineral deposits. So this is the Northeast Queensland Deposit Atlas, um, that a project that's now complete and we've released a whole series of volumes and are being uh, downloaded um, and, and used by industry. We've had extremely strong feedback from industry on those volumes. And 
Uh, another, I guess, one of the flagship projects associated with that initiative is is the um, the rare earth processing project, um, developing different approaches to to um, that that could be more sustainable and um, and and more suited to uh, a broader range of rare earth mineralization types, um, because it may well be that a hybrid approach that involves microbiological phytomining, hydrometallurgy approaches um, may be the best and most sustainable way to recover rare earths, um, a, a traditionally very challenging um, aspect. And then I'm getting towards the end now, uh, another project that feeds into the mineral supply side of things um, is a project that we've recently commenced working closely with um, the group Euclidean, which I really should have put on this slide and didn't. This is an example of a of a 100% collaborative project between a university and a, and a small medium enterprise, a Brisbane-based group called Euclidean or a Southeast Queensland-based group called Euclidean, who've developed a, a tool actually that started in the gaming scheme. But our vision here is to develop a, a, a three-dimensional uh, tool that will allow the visualization of massive data sets, terabytes and terabytes, petabytes, um, if that's a word, of, uh, of data covering, you know, in, our, in the case of this project, the entire state of Queensland, but ultimately a broader area where we can interrogate in three dimensions, um, not dependent on the, on the power of the computer or the speed of the internet connection in order to view massive um, three-dimensional geoscientific data sets and use that to improve exploration success. And then finally, um, the other thing I did want to point out is that, um, that we're involved in work that collaborates. I don't want to imply that we're doing just our own work. We're involved in a lot of work that collaborates across the SMI. Um, because, um, you know, I've said here, complex ore bodies is definitely a team sport. And, and this is an example where, where we're working on a feasibility staged undeveloped mine project that's currently uh, under, under the work that's been done uneconomic. But what we've been doing is looking at the whole range of social, environmental, technical and infrastructure challenges um, in this sort of tangled web of interconnections where all of the every single um, group within the SMI is is working on this problem, bringing their specific skills to focus on solutions in areas like value for the community, stakeholder equity, how to better manage the water, biodiversity, um, obviously the mining and processing, deposit knowledge, deposit knowledge, infrastructure, and and to place that all in a framework of 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 uh, risks that have been prioritized using um, modern tools in that area. So. Um, that's an important component of our work as well. So that really brings me to the end of what I wanted to say, other than to just to just summarize that that um, you know what I wanted to show you, I guess, was a snapshot of the the modern or the you know the the production centers of 2021, which is basically the JKMRC, BRC, and JK Tech working together with a broad range of industry partners. Um, I've listed across the bottom there some of the some of the impacts we've had over the years, but I've already spent a lot of time talking talking in that area, so so I, I won't labor that anymore. But I want to finish where I started, and that is that everything I've showed you um, in this talk has come from the people that you now see before you, um, and all of the other outputs pale in comparison to to the um, I guess development and and uh, and and ongoing sort of success of of those people. So. So with that, I'll finish up and say uh, thanks very much. All right, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, we've got um, the Q&A open. So um, if the participants online would like to put your questions into the Q&A session, we've got, um, got about 10 minutes for questions, which, um, which is good. So thanks, Rick. That's um, good to leave some time. Um, so the, the first question, I suppose, um, is, is a comment, but uh, do we get to hear your views on it? Is there scope to add another group to your research and consulting model that comprises consulting researchers, i.e., where 20 to 30% is research and the rest is consulting? 
almost opposite to the um, applied researcher, because um, this could have some real benefit. Um, yeah, the the, um, the 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 the, sh the very short answer to that is yes. Um, the 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 slightly longer answer is that I, I kind of showed showed those three different groups as um, as like a ternary diagram where where there's every likelihood that that some people may may sit in between that 100% research and and mostly uh, and and or you know the 100% consulting and mostly research and member um, and and that that you know that I guess the main the main thing I, I think that that differentiates us from a lot of the groups in the university is that is that many many groups in the university would be much closer to 100% being the the fundamental researchers um, and and they would have relatively few people who had who had that combination of of valuable industry experience as well as um, a strong enough academic background to to um, to be successful in the research area. But once you get past that part, once you get into that group where you've got people who have both um, research and consulting capability, then any percentage in between those two is is uh, is possible. All right. Um... Right, so here, yeah, come a couple of acronyms which um, we I'm probably going to have to um, work on. So, do we see the HDR ERC structure change to encourage more, I suppose, intrapreneurship and intrapreneurship? So, HDR would be higher degree researcher, and uh, um, ECR, which is early career research, if I've got that correct. Um, so, do we? see some change there to encourage more sort of entrepreneurship i think um i think we are seeing that a little bit um but i i, I think that there's scope to to um encourage that even more uh, i think it's uh, to me having gone to the trouble of you know looking at at the current initiative that's that's underway the current report um that's that's being led by by a, I guess a combined university and industry panel looking at better commercialization of industry research. This is that's very much the sort of thing that they want to see happen um, to a greater extent, and uh, and I think that um, and and I think that it will be great if um, if there are mechanisms by which we can gain more support for those sorts of uh, initiatives because what we found in the complex ore bodies program, but also when you look at some of the great successes of the of, of the JKMRC and JK Tech, um, is that a small amount of seed funding is applic applied at the right time is something sometimes all you need in order for, for the whole thing to catch fire and get to a commercialization stage. And, and uh, you know, there's a couple of examples of that. Um, uh, the the um, uh, mineral liberation analyzer, for example, was 100%. From what I understand, internally supported. Um, it was basically a bunch of people within the JKMRC said we need something like a mineral liberation analyzer, and and none of the potentially close uh, competitors can do what it needs to do right now. So we'll support it internally, and it turned into the the, the most implemented system of the various competitors that were available and and you know a more recent example is i think the the and and obviously the success of the coarse particle flotation research consortium was you know coming from a whole range of different areas but but uh, you know a small amount of seed funding from the complex ore bodies program at, at least provided a help to to get that across the line um, and I think that the same thing could be applied to a lot of the initiatives that are um, um, that um, you know that that various different students are doing. So we've got a group. It's not in the production centers, but I've been sort of following it with uh, with with interest. Um, I think they call themselves Environmetrics. Is that right? They Roger Tang and company um, 
taking a lot of the work they've been doing in remote sensing with um, and in, it's in associated environmental applications and starting a, up a company to see if um, you know if people want to come and work on that and traditionally what we we have done that through JK Tech um, but I think and 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 we are encouraging more of that sort of thing because JK Tech for the first time in a while this year has actually provided funds to the JKMRC to do exactly that including um, funding for three HDR students. So that was a very long answer, but a very good <laughs> No, no, it was a, a really, really good question. And I think that just, it follows up with um, yeah, just the, the comment around that both the US and UK have a higher startup output than Australia. And absolutely, I think it's that um, venture capital um, and also the, um, the, the, the postgraduates, HDRs and the ECRs having the opportunity to commercialize their ideas. Um, and absolutely, Rick, I think the, the big opportunities for us to be able to support that through JK Tech um, yeah. and have, have, have almost some seed funding, some venture capital there where we can, where we can do that. So I suppose watch the space. It's, a, it's an interesting opportunity. Um, Rick, I'm not seeing any other questions. I'm just going to leave it open for a second because I have to admit every time I, I start to wrap up, a question will pop in. Um, I thought what might be useful if you've got a couple of minutes, Rick, well, well, we've got a couple of minutes just to mention the new initiative that we're doing um, funded by the, the Bryan Foundation. Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, Neville. Yeah, I, I had meant to mention that and, and, and didn't. It's sort of at that, at that stage where we're, where we're, we're close to being able to, uh, you know, announce something more tangible, but one of the, obviously one of the challenges that we're, um, um, that 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 goes along with some of the, um, I guess, some of the broader industry challenges that I was talking about relate to the footprint of mining operations, um, particularly the footprint of of enormous open pit mines, um, and also the fact that we're discovering um, large um, ore bodies of, of many different types at greater depths now, understandably, than than we were in the past, and so um, it, it's very likely that a much larger proportion of new mines in the future will be underground mass mines. And, and one of the key challenges around establishment of an underground mass mine is an understanding of the geoscientific characteristics of that block cave that you want to establish. Um, any mine, any company establishing an operation like that carries enormous risk at the start of the project, um, because it can go, uh, you know, from what I'm told, um, it can go very wrong if you don't have a very good understanding of the geology, the geotechnical characteristics, the um, the the uh, and the whole other, uh, I guess, range of rock mechanics and engineering factors that may, um, you know, that may be important for the. Um, for the proper operation of that sort of mine. And so with the support of the Bryan Foundation, we've supported or we've, we've started a new program um, for which we're about to appoint a professor of mining geoscience. Um, and, uh, the, the, um, and, and, and the aim of that is to, is to produce, uh, I guess, a, a series of, of, um, of, of research projects that aim to reduce the risk associated with the uh, with the development of underground mass mines, um, and also to to I guess carry out research and and produce innovation that will help the job of a of an underground mining geoscientist in general. Because one thing that characterizes that, and and you know through industry consultation I've been doing in the last little while, this has come through really strongly is that the, a, a geoscientist as the sort of custodian of the rocks that communicates with everybody else in an operation like that, um, they're being um, required to deal with um, orders of magnitude, more data um, with greater complexity and to deal with it at a speed that never would have been expected previously. So um, rather than producing um, rather than producing a, a, a you know a, a new resource once a year, you got to do it twelve times a year or three hundred and sixty five times a year. And um, 
and you've got to develop an understanding of what's happening in in the mine at a rate where where potentially the um, the actual um, ongoing operations can be changed in a timely way. So for all those reasons, um, there's a lot of interest and support in developing a, a deep mining geoscience program. And, um, and that's now started. And we expect very soon to be able to announce a new professor of deep mining geoscience. So thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. No, 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 Rick, thanks. You, you sort of touched on it and um, we had a minute. So I thought we would, you could just open it up for a bit more. So Rick, thank you very much for your time. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation. And I'd just like to thank everybody who has dialed in for today's seminar. Um, we will put out the next seminar for next uh, month in September. And I look forward to, to seeing you all there. Um, I also look forward to catching up with those that can join us for, for tea um, in a socially distant way for spring day tomorrow. Um, so yeah, look forward to catching up with everybody. And thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. And Rick, thanks again for your presentation.